Hello everybody, welcome to our webinar. We are really excited today to give you a sneak peek of our future leadership lab that is coming up in October. And um, I'm delighted to be joined with uh, today by a couple of our faculty. Um, Ian Ellison, who is a fellow at CISL, Gillian Secret, Director of Leadership and Culture, and myself also a fellow. And uh, we send our best to Dr. Lou Drake, who is also joining us on faculty at the Leadership Lab. Um, I'm hoping she's on holiday somewhere enjoying the sunshine. So welcome, everybody. Uh, over the next hour, it's a great opportunity for us to just um, share some of the aspects of the lab, um, some of the contributors we've got coming up. And also, we really invite you in the chat to um, share with us what are the leadership challenges and dilemmas that you're facing at the moment? What's keeping you awake at night and what's getting you out of bed in the morning? Um, it's one of the things that we'll be discussing at the lab and we'd love to hear what's going on for you. So um, the Leadership Lab in October um, 20th and 21st, we will be looking at what are the leadership capabilities required for the 21st century? And uh, this is, I think, the fifth version of this lab that we've done. And it really is a wonderful two-day immersive program an opportunity to really equip leaders with the mindset, insight and practices to transform systems and deliver value for business and society. So you can see here, um, this lab is for you. If you've got five plus years of experience, um, you're dealing with um, strategic portfolios or sustainability portfolios and keen to advance your um, leadership acumen. So um, let's tell you a little bit more about who, who's going to be joining us um, and then we'll make sure we, we hand it over to, to questions. So as I said, um, this is our faculty of the programme and um, Ian, I'd love to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself before I hand over to Gillian. Thank you, Zoe. Yeah, Ian Ellison. So I'm a fellow of CISL. Uh, I have a corporate career that uh, spans several decades now working in finance, uh, engineering, uh, systems, and uh, a bit of sort of corporate restructuring, but the, the latter part of my career has been in, in sustainability. I left corporate life in 2018, and I spend most of my time doing this kind of thing, uh, CISL and sustainability programs with big corporates and helping uh, leaders find their way uh, on that kind of a journey. Lovely. Um, thank you, Ian, and welcome, Gillian. Hello everyone, um, I'm Director of Leadership and Culture at CSL and I'm working on developing the foresight and education, executive education. And prior to that, I was the CEO and Board Director at the Muller Institute and Fellow of Churchill College in the University of Cambridge. So I'm bringing together the sort of research and the practice of leadership and sustainability. And in my current work, I've co-authored the leadership framework with Zoe and Lou Drake, which I'll be able to share with you briefly today. And also I'm working on the future of boards work. I'm leading that research project, looking at the trends that are influencing board practice in service a sustainable future. So really focusing on how leaders and leadership can really make the biggest influence and impact. Brilliant, thanks. Thank you so much, Gillian. So let's have a quick look at um, who else will be joining us at the lab. Uh, and this is only um, a subset. Um, but I think what's really exciting, and we've got a host of other contributors actually over, over the, the, the two days, um, but what's interesting is how these contributors relate very much to the four principles that are part of our leadership framework. Uh, so Celine, Creo, um, Celine Crawford, who has been working at the highest level at Arab on business strategy for a number of years, um, we'll really be diving into a, a global collaboration case study. So really um, giving us the opportunity to expand what we mean by collaborative leadership. So we're looking forward to that. Alex Robinson is the CEO of Hubbub. For those of you who don't know, Hubbub is a really exciting, innovative environmental charity. And um, a lot of the work that they do is very, very, both very creative in its approach and also collaborative. So a lot of their, their campaigns work at a city level, working with local government and businesses um, and um, some, some real sort of fun and creativity attached to what they do. So we're looking forward to hearing from Alex. John Koo is, has recently shifted roles 
and um, after spending 14 years at Interface, um, he moved a couple of months ago to join the Lego Group. And he will be sharing some of the leadership challenges and dilemmas that he faces being relatively new into the organization. So it'd be really interesting to get a sense of what that looks like at the Lego Group. Um, and then finally, just on, on this, this round of contributors that we're sharing with you, Kim Wiley. So Kim brings a huge amount of leadership and development experience, having worked for many years at Google and Farfetch and now at Builder AI. So what is required if we are to lead high performing teams? So Kim will be sharing that with us. So, so just a glimpse at some of the speakers that will be joining us. So I'm going to stop sharing the slides now and open it up to um, Q&A uh, and look forward to your questions. But really just wanted to get a sense um, from Gillian and Ian. Um, some of the things that uh, we're looking forward to and what we'll be covering over the lab. Uh, so Ian, from, from your perspective, what, what, are you, what are you looking forward to and what are you looking forward to sharing at the lab? I think I'm looking forward to uh, meeting the delegates. I mean, each programme is different and a lab is a special kind of situation. It's, it's more interactive perhaps than our normal uh, programmes uh, and that kind of makes it unique. It's, it's not uh, like in a repeating event. It's a, it's a specific event in relation to the people uh, who are there. Um, so I think that's what I'm uh, most looking forward to. And um, what was the other part of the question? Sorry. What will you be contributing? What are you interested to share um, with? I, I think the I think when you look at the questions people are putting in and so forth, I think the there there is a a feeling of a kind of potential overwhelm with sustainability that there's so much going on, that there's so much to learn. Uh, and I think my perspective on that, and what I'll be trying to share, is is that was that is a huge and real challenge. Is actually really interesting uh, and exciting and challenging and worthwhile. You know, sustainability is such an important uh, topic uh, and, and so wide reaching that it is within reach of everyone to make an important contribution to that. So, to try and figure out what your contribution is uh, and try and make sense of it and, and, and really stretch to do the most you can in that space. So, I think that the, the excitement uh, and challenge of that and the reward for getting that right are the kind of things I'll be hoping to, uh, to bring to the, uh, to the party. Brilliant, lovely, thank you for that. And I know that we did get a question in advance, Ian, on, on one of your favorite topics at the moment, AI. Um, so I'm gonna to come to that actually after I've um, got Gillian to share the, the, the leadership capabilities framework with everyone. So, so just to give a heads up on that one. Um, and please do share any other questions or comments that you've got that you'd like us to, um, if you're coming to the Leadership Lab, what is it that you would like to, to be able to discuss, um, have conversations with your peers and, and really noodle over during, during two days like this? Um, so Gillian, over to you um, on that topic. What can participants hope to, to get out of the two days of the Leadership Lab, just building on what Ian said there? I think they can really, look forward to um, getting down to sort of the practical application and thinking about the capabilities in the leadership in their organization and how they can shape those capabilities and how they can shape the culture to enable the transformation and change to happen and working with peers in the room working with real life practical situations so we can actually use the framework uh, to provoke the discussion but actually really look at the nitty-gritty of how they can actually implement change through leadership and through influencing the culture and actually deal with their particular issues and dilemmas both from our perspective and also from all the different perspectives of their peers in the room. So it's a really rich conversation and, and very much focused on practical application. Great, Thank, thanks Gillian. And I know that we, we um, had great fun doing this recently together in Brussels um, at a symposium where we had exactly that. So a real range of stakeholders in the room yeah. um, and an opportunity to, to share what the framework um, capabilities framework looks like and how it shows up in their context. So on that note, it would be great, um, Gillian, if you could just um, give us a, a walk through the leadership capabilities framework. You mentioned at the beginning uh, that, that you, myself and Lou Drake co-authored this. Um, it came out um, to the, towards the latter part of last year 
And this is the first leadership frame, leadership lab where we really have the opportunity to, to dive into the principles um, and some of the mindsets and practices. And as you said, sort of apply that to um, the context that participants are, are coming from. Um, so if you could just um, give us a quick overview so people know what we're talking about. And we will also share a link to the report in the chat for people that want to dive in a little bit further. Thanks, Zoe. Okay, so just a very quick whistle-stop tour of the framework, which is an organising framework, uh, bringing together our research and the, the a breadth of uh, scholarly research and evidence uh, together with practical insights. And this is an organising framework that brings it together so that you can really grab hold of it and work with it in your organisations and your collaborations and across the system. And of course, the context in which we're currently operating is very complex. It's very uncertain and it's very ambiguous. So really, leaders can't possibly have all the answers. So we really need to help them to get used to not knowing the answers and to be agile and flexible and to get the best from all of the people around them so that we can really enact transformative change and, and really deliver for a sustainable future. And the framework actually helps us to do that. And we see leadership in a very multifaceted way. Um, we see it as a collective endeavor. It's not just about the person out there at the front, the great man or woman. Sometimes there's a role for that to, to take place. Sometimes we have to be out at the front guiding and directing, but there's other times when leadership needs to be much more of an enabler across an organization. And we have a multifaceted understanding of leadership, the, the who of leadership, the position and the person, the how of leadership, the process, um, the where of leadership, you know, it's influenced by the place and context in which we're operating and the why of leadership, the what and for whom. And it's the why of leadership that's really central to all of this. And the framework introduces uh, two P's and three C's in terms of how we try to remember and capture this knowledge. And I'm going to talk you through that. So the why of leadership. Why are we leading? Well, we believe that the ultimate purpose of leadership is to deliver a sustainable future, a future where everyone can thrive and that your organization's success and the value that it creates, which is absolutely essential and important, is a means to that ultimate end, to deliver a sustainable future, rather than your organization's success being the end in itself. And that's really important because it means we need to align everything we do to deliver organizational success, but ultimately to be able to deliver for society as a whole. And that framing is really central to our framework and our organizing structure. And basically what we're saying is that this ultimate purpose, what is it that your organization can uniquely provide in terms of the value it creates, but ultimately contribute to a sustainable future? And how is it positioned and where do you work in terms of the context and place so that you can actually adapt and change according to that context in which you're operating? The framework also is relevant for individuals and for collectives. So, you know, you can work in your own leadership, you can influence leadership across the organization, you can use these principles to influence the culture, the way the work that you work in your teams, the way you work collectively across your supply chain and across your networks, and really across the system. So it's been designed to help you to see that these foundational principles, the four C's, are relevant across all individuals and collectives. And we think that's really important so that you know we can keep it simple, but those foundational principles need to apply. So those foundational principles are connected, collaborative, creative, and courageous. And connected is one of the foundation pieces because actually we need to make sure that leaders understand the system in which we operate. They need to understand the interdependencies between each other and between people and nature and really understand those empathetic relationships and understandings that are really important for really that systemic piece, really understanding how your organization has an impact across the system and how you can ensure that the connections that you make are really effective. 
Collaborative is the second principle. We know that it's really important to ensure that we collaborate across the system. This is a massive task we have to achieve. We can't do it on our own. So we need to work together. We need to obviously make those connections. We need to understand the system and we need to collaborate with others. We need to be clear about our end goal to deliver a sustainable future so we can all align behind that and really get clever about listening and understanding different perspectives to bring that diversity of thought around the table. And that's really important to be inclusive and to listen and to really make those smart decisions for the collective um, so that we can move this agenda forward. Our fourth principle is creative, really important because we have to find new solutions. And I know that Ian may say more about this, you know, that real creative situation where we can find solutions for the opportunities that the sustainability agenda presents for us. Really um, setting a safe environment so that people feel safe and brave to put forward new ideas and also to speak their truth so that we can have that creative tension from which new ideas and innovations can emerge because we do need new solutions here. So creative and creating that space in the, your leadership for people to be creative and to feel safe to trial and test, sometimes to fail, but to really move things forward is essential. And then finally, the fourth principle, courageous, I think is really important. I think it's so important that you know personally in your leadership what you stand for so that you can really be true to the values and purpose that you have and you can stick forward when you want to make a change you can influence change because you feel anchored in your own worldviews and self-belief and your own understanding of that sustainable future and really stick with the values that you stand for um, in order to pursue societal good overall and I think that comes from really being self-aware from knowing yourself and your own personal purpose and we do some work on this on the program so that you can really understand what you want to change how you want to influence change how you can align your own purpose with that of the organization and really build that resilience of your own leadership and of your organization to deliver positive and transformational change and of course all of this we need to remind ourselves it's nested in the context in which you're operating and we need to be flexible to adapt to the different cultures and contexts um, where we are. And we need to you know, really think about what are the mindsets and practices at play in terms of the leadership and the culture of organizations to achieve a sustainable future. And that's what we're really going to get into the depths of in the program and apply, you know, what are those mindsets and practices? How would they show up in your organizations and your collaborations and your supply chains and working across the system? And how can you influence positive change. So really that's just the quick overview so you get a sense of understanding of where we're coming from with this. Brilliant, really really nicely done Gillian, thank you. Um, and we'd love to hear from you, what are those principles, how, how do they resonate with you? you know, can you can you see how they're, they're showing up in your organisation or the opportunities if those leadership principles um, were fostered, what might that look like? And we've, we've shared a link in the chat there to, to the report so that you can um, dive into those a little bit more. Um, but yes, we'd love to, to hear from you on those in particular. And, and um, I'm looking at um, one of the questions that we've already had because um, I was thinking as you answered, as you were talking about the framework, Gillian, the question that we've had, you know, I'd be really keen to hear about how to tackle that feeling of overwhelm um, that Ian mentioned and, and for me what I pulled out of, of what you shared there was that sort of staying grounded and anchored in your personal purpose um, and you know hopefully aligning that to the organizational purpose is, is a great way of knowing even despite you know choppy waters that you've you've got that north star that you're you're aiming at I think building the self-awareness as you talked about as well and, and having the courage to to know what you stand for and I know you talk about sort of stepping up um, and then and stepping forward and enabling others to do that as well as is a, a key part of that and then I think the other po point that I'd pull out on you know what how do we tackle those feelings of overwhelm is it's really developing a sense of dynamic authenticity so acknowledging when we're not in alignment um, perhaps to our best selves 
um, which 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 happens. Um, we have those those moments. Um, but I'd love to hear from from both of you if you have any other thoughts on how we tackle those those feelings of overwhelm. Ian, do you want to share? As someone who has been through um, seriously choppy waters with some <laughs> big global yeah, some wines and enjoyed it. But the, the yeah, I, I think I think you hit on some of the soft issues there, uh, Zoe, about your your sort of how you how you handle yourself in a leadership role. And I think um, one of the things that I'll be bringing along to the to lab is is a, is a more kind of technical uh, element of that. You know, how to think about the, the task of management and leadership uh, in relation to an organisation. Um, and you know, the way I was taught to do leadership, you know, if it got complicated, break it down into smaller pieces and then tackle all the smaller pieces and assemble them back into the solution. Uh, what you might call re reductionist approach to, to to leadership and the the um and, and i think that if you if you try to do that in the current environment especially in relation to sustainability it can feel overwhelming because you'll be left with an awful lot of pieces to try and process uh, and prioritize and then reintegrate um and so the 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 approach that i've kind of uh, found successful in this is looking at much more stepping back rather than forward into the detail and looking at the situation as a system, you know, how do the parts interact and understanding the flows of information and power and knowledge and whatever, um, and then trying to work out how to affect the system at a, at a high level to, to, to get outcomes from its behavior rather than breaking it down into this kind of reductionist boxed up kind of um, siloed uh, solutions that you then reintegrate. And that, that approach of seeing things through the lens of systems that allows you to understand what is actually happening and it allows you to create some distance between the, that overwhelm, which is, you know, you know, if you look in the public discourse in the news, you know, this stuff happening every day. And, you know, you know, I looked at the news last night and it was like 80% bad news and, and all this stuff happening. You, you feel it's kind of attacking you and you know, it's kind of overwhelming in, in every sense. Um, but if you step back, you can say, well, actually, it's, it, these are symptoms of the way the world works. You know? So if you look at things through the lens of systems, you can start to process it. And so actually there are, there are a handful of manageable things that we could tackle which would stop the situation producing these outcomes rather than having to tackle things uh, through the, the uh, a transactional level. So, so that's a shift in perspective uh, from transactional to systems perspective. And, and I'd say that that might sound a bit technical, but there are practical ways uh, that you can deal with that, which is the kind of thing I, I'll, I'll be talking about in my own contributions to that. Lovely, thanks Ian. Um, and Gillian, I, I, I really liked how you talked about creative in that overview. You know, actually, we need to welcome the creative tensions, yeah. um, conflicts in organisations if we are going to discover new solutions and innovations. Um, and I think that that's also part of shifting that perspective, isn't it? Um, Agreed. Yeah. How we how we consider that so that we don't get overwhelmed. I'd love to know if there's anything you'd like to add there. I think just building on what Ian was saying, you know, the systems piece, understanding the system. If you think about your leadership team and your cultural uh, of your organization and the culture that you build within your collaborations as part of that system, if you start to influence through using the leadership framework, you know, how those teams, those people, the organization, the collaborations, how they work, you start to have a number of people then that are all working in the same direction as you are and if you can have a really clear purpose for your organization that everyone can align behind and the same if you're purposeful in your collaborations you know what are we here to do to do together then everybody's working in the same direction so you end up having so much more energy and resource at your fingertips in your leadership to work across the system because everybody's on the same page and is moving forward to find those ideas and solutions and if you can create a safe environment where people are psychologically safe to actually test and experiment and to challenge each other actually about decisions and dilemmas so that those new ideas can emerge because it's often if you think about it it's when we have attention that we often find the best solution because we've got so many thoughts around the table and we can bring forward what's really going to work. So, you know, I think that systemic piece, thinking about your leadership role as influencing the system through the people and then make sure, and this is really important, make sure that you notice when people are doing the things that you're expecting them to do and when they're behaving and taking things forward in the way you want. So if you really notice that, then it really starts to grow and snowball and you can start to implement the changes that you're looking to make. Yeah, lovely. Thanks, thanks, Julian. Absolutely. I think that point about tension, you know, sometimes we narrow ourselves down too quickly and we don't fully explore 
um, different options. You know, I, I love this this concept of the mind trap of agreement. You know, actually, when we create artificial harmony, it just takes up so much more time and en energy, constantly trying to go around and and seek alignment. When actually, what we really should do is, you know, make sure we've ex fully explored all the different options and brought that that creative tension to bear. Super. Um, so we've got a, a few other questions. There's one thing I, I think that you know I, I, I thought we'd been really clear about, but Gillian, you, there's a question in terms of you know what was the thinking behind removing organizer, organizational success from the framework? Um, and, and just to clarify, these are leadership capabilities, um, and and absolutely we're very clear about you know we're um, not organizational success is 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 clearly key. Um, to organisations, but Gillian, I know that that's one that you're always keen to make sure that we we clarify. Um, I wonder if you wanted to um, yeah. respond to that. Um, organisational success is absolutely essential. Um, so I don't see how we 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 haven't removed it from the framework. Um, what we're saying is that organisational success is an absolutely essential means to deliver a sustainable future. Because if the organisation fails, it's not going to be able to deliver anything. So you know that the individual accountability across your organisations and the individual performance across your organisation, so that you can create value for your organization and for all of your shareholders and stakeholders is absolutely central to this work. That's a given, it has to be done. But what we're saying is that if we see that in service of the bigger picture that ultimately you're contributing to a sustainable future in the way you're operating rather than taking away from a sustainable future, rather than saying, well, we're only going to benefit this group of people here and we're going to have a negative externality which will impact these people over here. We're actually thinking, well, if we can work in a way that we deliver value for our stakeholders and shareholders and we create organizational success, but we're also mindful of being positive in the impact that we have for society as a whole. We're not damaging our environment, we're not you know, polluting um, and we're not creating challenges in communities, then we're able to do both. And that's what we're saying. So we're absolutely not taking organizational success out of the framework. Yeah, lovely, thank you. Um, now I want to honour some of the questions that we got in advance. Um, and Ian, I gave you a heads up about this one um, and would love to get your thoughts now that Gillian's um, sort of unpacked the capabilities framework for us. Um, in relation to AI specifically, what does creative, connected, collaborative, courageous leadership look like? It's a very big question. So, so perhaps just some, some top of mind thoughts on that would be appreciated. Yeah, I mean, obviously our AI is in the news a lot at the moment, um, and, and you know, the, the connected element is, is kind of a given in that you're connecting a lot of data uh, that has been harvested and offered to you in a quite unique uh, and uniquely valuable uh, format. Um, I, I think the, 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 there's a tendency then to sort of go into the, the tool and kind of you know, interact with it, but you still have to be collaborative and relate that to, to the wider world. So the, the collaborative element uh, is, is still there the creative element is is really key both in terms of how do you use this tool which seems to have you know some magical properties that we've not really been able to uh, surface before so there's an adventure to be had in in thinking about how can we use that and there's certainly people have postulated that in it, to achieve sustainability in any meaningful way we can't do it without ai supporting us and multiplying uh, our efforts um, and, but to also be creative in you know, the ways that we, we use the tool and the way that we interact with it. You, know, you may not have written a computer program before, you may not have edited a photograph before. It, it can help you with these uh, capabilities. So you push yourself, be courageous uh, and, and, and use the tool, push what it can do and what you can do. I think having said all of that, I mean, I think it adds something to all of those four C's. I would, in this case, add a fifth C, which is just be cautious. Um, we, there are a whole series of things. Yeah, it, it says on it all the time. I'm not always right. You know, don't believe everything I tell you. So I think you have to develop that critical thinking, ask it questions that are um, uh, you know, that you you can gauge on whether we, you're getting the truth and check the answers. Don't take actions on things before. So there's an element of understanding what it's like, which we've seen before. You know, you don't go into Wikipedia and believe everything it says. It's a starting point for other conversations and, and activities that you validate. Uh, there's also the ethical thing of you know where is this data come from 
Um, so making sure that you you understand um, you know, as much as you can what what uh, has been done to provide you with that data, and there's a legal thing of using data that that may or may not have uh, been acquired in a in a completely legal way. And in that sense, I kind of compare it to where we were with Napster 23, four years ago, where where you could suddenly get all the music on the planet for free, but actually it, it wasn't legally checked. You know, and we'll get through that. And, and we got uh, music streaming through uh, the likes of Spotify and iTunes that was legal. But we're in this kind of twilight zone here where there's a capability whose uh, legitimacy is still being challenged. So you'll see things in the press uh, that are very exciting or very scary and I think it's about trying to understand um, what the real value add is this and, and looking to where its long-term contribution is and how that relates to you which is an interesting metaphor anyway for leadership in sustainability in that you know you can look very transactionally at, at, at things that are coming up every day or you can look at your long-term purpose going to the center of the model here uh, and how you relate to all those things and keep keep that as a kind of guiding Star. So I think I think AI has got really exciting contributions to 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 make, um, but you've got to understand where we're at at the moment in its evolution. It's very early days at the moment uh, to be using it as a full strength corporate tool. But it, but equally that that shouldn't be a reason to um, to step away from it. You've got to engage because it isn't going to go away, and it is going to make a valuable contribution despite all the risks. Yeah. Great, Thank, thanks Ian, that's that's super helpful. So one of the questions that we got asked in advance is, you know, what will I be taking away from the lab? So I, I wanted to just take a moment to share sort of seven key things that you can put in your toolkit um, if you come and join us at the lab. Um, well, we will be exploring sustainability leadership capabilities, as we've said, you know, which enable us to manage risk and leverage opportunities um, for the benefit of people, nature and planet. Um, and, and those sort of seven key things that we'll be doing over the two days. Firstly, we'll be sharing insight into to key dilemmas. Um, what are some of the dilemmas that, that you're facing when it comes to leading transformative change? Um, and discuss how these new leadership capabilities can help navigate these. Secondly, as, as Gillian said, you know, we're going to be making sure that that conversation is very much anchored in, you know, what are your per what's your purpose, values and worldviews? Um, and what's it look like to align personal purpose with um, our professional purpose and our wider societal goals that we have within our organisations? Um, thirdly, we'll be Look, experimenting with strategies and tools when it comes to expanding our sphere of influence um, and inspiring and engaging others, which we know um, continues to be a key challenge that we face in our organizations. Um, next, we're actually going to discuss what's it look like to nurture that collective capacity for change. Um, and six, um, going back to our overwhelm question, how do we build our, our resilience and capacity to, to keep adapting um, in a world that we know gets in, increasingly volatile? Um, and then finally, we'll, we'll be engaging with some, some problem-based learning exercises that, that really that we can then use to apply what we're learning over the couple of days. So thinking about you know, long-term versus short-term thinking, when sometimes there is misalignment between personal purpose and organizational purpose, um, and when there is resistance to change or, or perhaps a, a clash in, in diverse values. Um, so just wanted to, to make sure that we, we outlined all of those. Um, so coming to, to you, Gillian, um, so there's, there's quite a lot of things that we're gonna be putting, putting in our, our toolkit. Was there anything we, we got, did get asked the question, you know, what is it that what's the one thing that we can walk away from? How, how would you summarize that, Gillian, if you were going to, to sum up the one thing that people walk away from with from the lab? Well, I'd really hope they would walk away with the courage and the self-awareness and confidence to really start to influence change in their organization and to know how to get started with that. And, most of the people in the room will have been doing this already, but helping them to really work through the challenges and dilemmas that they have to really build that inner 
knowledge and confidence within themselves and the courage to actually keep pushing things forward so that they really feel they can get to action with a renewed sense of energy and vigor and with a network of people to support them that they've built during the program and, and the support here from CISL so that actions can start to be more impactful and that they can actually really feel they've achieved something after the two days and work through some of the difficult challenges that they have. So, you know, very much feeling more confident and resilient and courageous in themselves and having the, 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 the wherewithal in their toolkit to be able to go back and take action and to focus on those first next steps when they get back. Yeah, lovely. Thanks, Gillian. And it's worth emphasising, I think, that, that one of the real joys of these, these two days immersive programmes is the peers that you're, yeah. the participants that you're alongside with. Um, this is not a sort of transmission lecture format by any means. It's, it's very much around, about learning from the, the mind trust in the room, um, learning from each other's experience where you know, obviously we're, we're working under Chatham House. Um, our contributors will be sharing very openly and um, other participants will also be sharing their challenges and dilemmas. And I think you know, that's a really important point to emphasise. And what we've always noticed is that we have a real blend of multiple stakeholders, whether that's um, from government organisations, business, um, NGOs. So, so that in itself is, is a great opportunity. Um, Ian, uh, over to you. So, sorry, sorry you get... I was just going to say to follow up, you know, having two days to really focus on, you know, where am I in this? Where am I in my leadership? And what are the things that I know I can really step forward and influence? So getting that clarity over the two days as to, as to what your unique role is and going away with much more clarity and understanding about how you can best contribute, I think is really important. And we will do everything we can to support you on that journey. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and practically that looks like um, having peer coaching conversations, working on your own leadership action plan specifically about what, what, what you are going to start, stop, continue after the two days. Um, but Ian, over to you, what's the, what's the one thing um, that you, you feel is, is most important that people can, can take away from, from our leadership lab? I think an, an openness, um... To, to try things out and do, and, and, and Gillian already mentioned your action, you're actually taking some action because there, there is a tendency to come to something like this and we'll load you with stuff and, and I feel like I need, I need to do more training. I can get started if I do more training or I have another lab like this or I, do, you know, I get a qualification or something. Um, and, and, when, and when we talk to people, you know, people often say, oh, well, you know, I or we as an organization are very far behind and, and, and almost everybody says that. So somebody has to be in the front, you know, so, so um, th this is a, an emerging kind of art slash science here. So, so the thing is to get involved and to take action, and to be and to know you don't have all the answers, but neither does anybody else, uh, and be prepared to actually take action, learn from that progressively, uh, and and to, to make that action scale up. You know, so so yeah, you know, we're looking for things which are action orientated, not not kind of theoretical uh, or delaying action. Uh, and things that will scale to um, you know, to have real impact uh, on 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 the topic, and, the, and there's a there's a kind of um, method, if you like, to 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 understanding where you can actually take action and for it to be you know, sufficient and, and safe, and how to then scale that up. So I think that being open to just getting on with some stuff and learning as you go, uh, and and doing that in relation to others, are the, the things that I the hope to sort of foster with people. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, lots of action and um, one of the action related questions that we've, we've had in the chat is, um, Gillian, I don't know if you want to uh, have, a, have a go at this one, which is what kind of dynamic leadership practices need to be inculcated in current governance? Um, just going back to you, in current governance, especially considering climate change actions and climate adaptation. I think that, um, you know, from from a governance perspective, it's really important to think about the the hardware, if you like, the structural systems and processes that you have in place to manage and monitor what takes place in the organization. And then the software side of things, which is the behaviors and the way you want to operate in your culture to make sure that people 
are accountable and behave in a way that delivers on the sustainable outcomes that you're looking for around the climate piece and the adaptation piece. So I think we need to work at both levels with the governance. And I think governance requires both. You need the structure and the framing for those decisions and monitoring, but you also need the culture and the leadership to ensure that those are adhered to because it all comes down to how people behave, how they show up, what they do, and what gets tolerated and what doesn't get tolerated. And I think that's a really important um, frame for governance too. So the leadership principles are just as valid in terms of a governance piece in an organization as they are in terms of leadership. Because in my book, leadership and governance obviously sit hand in hand. So really deciding what the actions are in terms of your cli climate adaptation and mitigation, creating the right framework and structures to make sure those practices happen within the organization so that you can monitor and make sure that you're accountable for what you're trying to achieve there, but then also making sure that you pay attention to people's behaviors and practices around the framework, both in the organization and across the system in which you're collaborating to achieve this climate work um, so that you can actually you know, achieve the outcomes you're looking for. So I would focus on the hardware and the software and make sure that you're working at both levels to achieve that in your governance. Mm, lovely. And I just wondered, because I know that you've, you've done so much work on the future of boards, whether there were any other insights um, to draw on that you've not covered there when it comes to the, sort of the governance piece. I think it's really important from the work I've done uh, on the future of boards is to really ensure that your 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 board of directors are really on the same page that you're on and make sure that they're well aware of the risks and the opportunities of the sustainability agenda and that they see it as a part of their role to ensure that sustainability is integrated into the overall purpose and strategy of the organization so that it's really coming from the top down and the bottom up um, so that the organizational purpose and alignment to deliver a sustainable future rings true throughout the organization and across the systems in which it operates. And obviously with the supply chain due diligence coming in, the, the European directives, you know, we really have to consider how our extended networks and, and uh, ecosystems, if you like, in which we operate. And so all of these things need to spread across that. And I think it's important that the board can see that systemic piece, that they understand how important it is that they are on the same page, they are able to push the boundaries and um, help the organization to take things forward. So that governance piece coming from the board is absolutely essential. There's obviously a lot of legal pieces coming through with reporting and so on, which is, a, is which is a good push. Obviously, it is influenced by investors and the demands that they're making and the cost of capital and so forth. But uh, it's absolutely essential that the board don't just do what they need to do to comply, but they actually see, you know, this can really benefit our organization's business and creation of value you know this sustainability is a massive opportunity if we mm. think about how our products and services can actually service a sustainable future then we're going to have a marketplace that's there for a long time forever so why not use it and seize it and get the board to really see that dimension of sustainability rather than putting it just in the risk box and um, thinking about it on the risk register they need to also think about it in terms of business opportunity brilliant and the lovely. governance of that great thank you thank you Gillian so just to acknowledge we're down to our last 15 minutes uh, we'd love to get further questions and comments in the chat. Uh, thank you very much for um, the, the comments in the chat about, for me personally, it's about building personal agility to embrace change positively towards a, a more equitable and sustainable future. Um, I love that. Thank you. Um, and again, I, I just wanted to bring in um, a question that very much builds on that sort of embedding piece. Um, so to you, Ian, we had a question in advance, which was, you know, we've tried introducing sustainability initiatives before and encountered cynicism. What can I do to get more buy-in? I mean, this, this is a great question related to, to leadership capabilities. So we'd we'll be keen to, to get your response on that one, Ian. Yeah, and it's, a, and it's a key question as well. I mean, when I when I entered the automotive industry, um, what, what the a kind of looked at the way my team were reacted to by the rest of the business and they, they were perceived as being somewhere 
on a tightrope between a compliance organization and a PR organization, you know, and, and, and somewhat framed as the naughty police, you know, people would run away from us as we went down the corridor because they, they thought we were trying to catch them doing something that wasn't within our sustainability rules. And I thought, well, this is, this is a really odd way to relate to the subject because that's not how I see it, you know, and so I spent my time trying to um, shift where we were, how we were perceived to be more an engine of innovation, your problem solvers, like you could come to us with a problem and we'd say, okay, we've got a way of seeing this, a way of thinking about this and we can solve that. And it wasn't, I wasn't in a sort of power position to be able to impose that. So it had to be done incrementally by in, in steps to say, look, you know, we'll solve this problem. So oh, you got any more solutions like that? So you build that organically out to say, actually this way of looking at things isn't just about, you know, staying out of jail and creating some positive PR uh, for the brand, yeah, but it, it's actually about solving real problems, you know, and, and I was doing this from within the sort of product development and engineering function, which, which we were supposed to be doing is solving problems, but it was seen as the problem we were supposed to be perceived as solved was with this with kind of perception and, and compliance, as opposed to what should we be building, um, how should we be building it, what kind of supply chain do we want, and how should we offer it to the market, you know, really fundamental strategic questions. So, um, I think that the that the embedding is is, is that shift, and, and if you if you've got that being driven from the top, great. That's that's not your problem. But if you haven't, then you have to build that, and it's in building the perception of what you you do um, step by step. And even uh, you know, Jimmy was saying there's a certain amount of kind of structural governance that you need in place. Even some of that doesn't always deliver what you want. Uh, I I was in a for a while working in an organisation where we started every week with a strategy meeting. Uh, we sounded fantastic you know we we're always focused on strategy in fact it was a transactional firefighting you know what what's what's kicked off last week that we need to fix this week there was no strategy discussed in there um and it's not that we shouldn't put the fires out but you, you have to give some air time to the, the notion of uh sort of strategic long-term purposes we have at the, the center of the, the framework there and do everything in relation to that uh, you know not just putting out fires but doing the fire prevention as well so again you've got to shift even if you have something that looks like the right structure it has to be working on the right um, topics to to truly deliver and sustainability for me is is a problem solving tool um, and and a um, you know it can attack the root causes and prevent some of the symptoms that you end up drowning in and that that shifting perception is a really important thing to get your head around and then to be able to help other people get their head around because it, it, there are there's a certain amount of prejudice in the way that sustainability is seen which which drives this cynicism that came up in the question. Yeah, lovely. Thanks, Ian. Um, and I just wanted to pick up on on, on the question that we've had um, about failure. Uh, so we had the question, you know, we'll give, give an example of learning from a failure. We've used, we're used to failing fast when it comes to product design, but less so with leadership, which feels more intangible. And I just, you know, love what you were saying there, Ian, about, you know, we, we need to provide more airtime to putting out the fires as well as fire prevention. And sometimes we just need to acknowledge that the fire is still smouldering away there. Um, and I think you know what's what's interesting is you know how increasingly we 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 talk about um, culture in our programs um, and the importance of, of of culture and creating a psychologically safe culture where people can you know experiment safely and and, and learn fast. And I know that we often quote Professor Amy Edmondson who talks about how important it is for you know leaders to acknowledge their fallibility. And apologise for when they when they perhaps haven't made things safe in the past, and and, that, and that's very much around sort of acknowledging you know when we make mistakes in our leadership. Uh, but Gillian would love to give you the opportunity to reflect on that question as well. Thanks, Zoe, and I I love what you're saying there. I mean, I think it's really important for leaders to have the courage to be authentic and to speak up when they do get it wrong, but also to create the space in the organization and a culture in the organization where I say safe but brave, um, where people can actually support and challenge each other so they can call it out when it isn't working. And so in the leadership team, you can have those conversations about what's worked and what hasn't worked and you can learn from each other because in my career, I've learned so much from watching people who have done good leadership, but I've actually learned just as much and probably more from actually been on the receiving end of poor leadership and what that feels like and actually really looking and talking about that and seeing the impact of good and bad leadership is, is really important. And just to pick up on one specific example of, um, you know, leadership and failing in leadership when 
I've seen examples where you know people have put in um, performance review systems and um, systems where people are re rewarded for certain outcomes, you know, pay rewards uh, and incentive schemes. And I've seen those have been set up, and then the results that we've got have not been what we've been looking for. But that's because when you examine them, that performance rewards have come purely from creating value in terms of profits, but not looking at value created across other aspects of the work. Um, and when things have been approached in, in, in a difficult way that hasn't given the outcomes that you need. So from a leadership perspective, been really looking at the tools and the structures that you have in place for your leadership to work effectively, you know, really learning when they don't work and you don't get the outcomes you're looking for, well, do something about it, change the review structure so that it's giving you the outcomes you're looking for so that you're rewarding and acknowledging what you're actually looking for in terms of creating value for the organization, but also creating value and impact from a sustainability perspective. Yeah, great. Ian, was there anything you wanted to add on that one? Um, yeah, I think I mean you, you can look at my own industry, and there's an interesting statistic from from last year when you look at the the automotive industry and the incumbents, of which there are eight brands in the top ten brands in the world, where uh, the incumbents have tended to grasp to, at what they've always done and try to move into the into the future with your know, hybrid cars and things that are you know small steps in that direction with a lot of lobbying not to change too fast towards electric vehicles or any other kind of shift in the business model. And then the, in the top eight, there are two new entrants, which is BYD in China and, and Tesla. And the market capitalization of those two companies is the same almost as the other eight added together. You know, and that, 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 that's leadership coming in saying, we're going to disrupt this because it's broken and the incumbents aren't making anywhere near the right progress. So we will really uh, you know, take a different view of the market and, and, and lead the whole sector in a different direction widely mocked when I was in the automotive industry as, as not really knowing what they were doing and you know, not, not knowing how to make a car and so on. But there's no mocking going on now. You know, the, the two companies worth as much as eight that, that have been around for 100 years, and those two companies have only been at any scale for 10 years. That's a massive kind of mirror held up to the industry to say, you, you've misunderstood, you, you've misled your industry. You've, you, you need to make it a, a sharp transition to a new future, and you're now playing catch up. And, and some of those companies will catch up, some will struggle. But there's an element of not recognizing the degree of change and the scale of change there and, 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 and clinging to what you know and what you feel is safe to the point where it's actually dangerous. You know, that, that, so that, that, that's a, you know, a, a big headline kind of uh, you know, the, leading the way you've always done it as opposed to saying something needs to fundamentally change and I need to lead that change and I need to brave up to getting everybody around me to join in. Uh, and it's very hard for incumbents, you know, is why I joined an incumbent to try and sort of see how that, that works, because we, we, not everything's going to be a starter. And that's yeah. where courage comes in, isn't it? You absolutely have to have the courage to mm. keep going when everybody's pushing in a different direction. Yeah, it's a lonely, it's a lonely cause, but that's, yeah, that's, that's what we're here for, to support people. And, exactly. yeah, it's important. and that resilience. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and I always find great comfort in reminding myself about, you know, how we're wired. No, because we, you know, we we do tend to fall into these leadership mind traps just because of how our, our brains are wired, which is, you know, we we're wired to be in control, to seek to seek agreement. And I I I always find um, Sachin Adela, the CEO of Microsoft, hugely inspiring when he talks about, you know, how do, how do we how can we create a learn it all? How do we go from a know it all culture to a learn it all culture? And I think, you know, this point about um, sort of um, leadership and failure. Actually, if you have a learn it all culture, you know, if you're if you're brave enough to say, I don't know, what do you think? You know, that's when you start to get into new and interesting territory um, mm. because we can't possibly have all the answers. We need to you know, assemble many, many different types of, of 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 people around us so that we can can come up with new, innovative ways of of, of thinking and doing. Brilliant. Well, I can't believe we're nearly an hour through this, this webinar. We do hope that um, some of you who have joined us today or will be watching the recording of this will, will also join us um, in October for the two days. We've given you a sense of what we'll be covering off. Um, so I'd just like to go to our, our final slide now, which, which is a reminder of um, how to sign up for the lab and, and where to go to, to get more information. Um, so you can see here, 
Uh, our lab on leadership capabilities for the 21st century will be at beautiful Maddingley Hall um, from October the 21st to the 22nd. Um, we'd love to have um, applications in for that uh, the month before. Um, so do please get in touch if you want to know more details. Um, as you know, we've put um, a link to uh, the leadership capabilities framework in the chat as well. Um, so, so do please let us know if you've got any questions or comments um, and uh, we'll be really, really keen to explore those further um, at the lab alongside um, Ian Gillian and also um, Lou Drake will be joining us and an incredibly, incredible group of contributors as well. Um, so before we close, uh, I'd love to just hear um, Ian and, and, and Gillian just a, a closing remark, really. Um, what are you mo What are you most excited about when it comes to um, our leadership lab in October? What are you looking forward to? Ian, do you want to go first? Go first, yeah. Yeah, I, I think most of all, meeting the de delegates. You know, I mean, always we get such exciting people come to CISL programs. Uh, and really experiencing with them the journey that they take. And the reason I work with CISL is it, it reliably delivers not just training programs, but actual experiences where people go away and reflect back at the end. That, that was something different. That was something beyond what I normally expect from a program like this. And I now look at the world differently and I'm prepared to go out and actually make my uh, uh, share of change in it. And in fact, that transition that, that we so often see with people coming through the program and what and where they'll be taking that to in their industry and their role, I find absolutely exciting and, and the best thing about these kinds of programs. Yeah, lovely. Thank you, Ian. Gillian? Well, I'm really excited about working with the delegates that come to the program, really hearing their real life issues and challenges and helping them to think about the leadership and culture in the organisation and how to drive that positive change and really getting their practical uh, feedback in terms of how the framework lands, how it looks for them in practice in terms of how they would apply it and we'll be sharing stories there and really helping us as well to think well maybe some things need to be adapted and flexed and what more can we add to build out um, our framework and how can we help you more in terms of your implementation and action. So really excited about the opportunity. Yeah absolutely and um, for my part um, I know that I always create a, a shift in my leadership capability, being hugely inspired and, and learning from the participants that are with us, their openness to explore their challenges and dilemmas, and also the great contributors that we will um, also attract. Um, and we do have a few um, keynotes that are still under wraps um, that will be really, really exciting, and I'm, I'm personally looking forward to those. Uh, so do hope that you can join us October 21st to the 22nd to look at leadership capabilities required for the 21st century. Um, thank you very much for joining us today and particular thanks to Ian and Gillian for a really great conversation. So um, thank you all. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you all. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Bye.